I'm Lisa German. I'm the Dean of the Libraries, and it is, uh, we're so pleased to have you all here tonight. And tonight we have the privilege of hearing from San Friedman, award-winning author, journalist, and educator. In fact, this is our second event with Sam this fall. In September, Sam presented at Cowell's Auditorium about his new book, Into the Bright Sunshine, which examines Hubert Humphrey's early career when his efforts to promote racial justice not only transformed the Democratic Party, but the nation as well. Tonight, Sam will discuss the same book, but with a different context. His talk will focus on the aspects of the book that deal with Humphrey's relationships with the local Jewish communities. In a July 13th, 2023 review of Sam's book in the New York Times, the writer states, Friedman tells a surprising and rare history of black and Jewish Americans fighting against racism and anti-Semitism, often side by side in a new northern city before the civil rights era. His brilliant profiles of these local heroes are gripping, and in many ways, the spine of the book. And for me, I didn't grow up in Minnesota, so reading this book was um, particularly poignant. The writing of that history was made in part by the research in the local archival collections, including the Berman Upper Midwest Jewish Archives. Sam's research is the backstory of Into the Bright Sunshine, and it's a powerful example of the value of libraries and archives. The Berman Upper Midwest Jewish Archives, as are all our special collections, are located in the caverns below this building. They're available to anyone, researchers, teachers, students, authors, documentary film producers, community groups, or anyone with a specific curiosity or a desire to learn. The Berman Archives are curated by our very own Kate Dietrich. Kate will speak next, but first I would like to acknowledge the peoples upon whose land we meet. The University of Minnesota Twin Cities is built within the traditional homelands of the Dakota people. It is important to acknowledge the peoples on whose lands we live, learn, and work as we seek to improve and strengthen our relations with tribal nations. We also acknowledge that words are not enough. We must ensure that our institution provides support, resources, and programs that increase aspects to all, access to all aspects of higher education for American Indian students, staff, faculty, and community members. Now please join me in welcoming Kate Dietrich. Thank you, Dean Lisa. Again, my name is uh, Kate Dietrich. I'm the archivist for the Upper Midwest Jewish Archives, and thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, a quick word about our speaker, Samuel G. Friedman. He's an award-winning author, journalist, and educator, and professor at Columbia University. He has been a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Awards, and has won the National Jewish Book Awards and the New York Public Library's Helen Bernstein Award. His publication, Into the Bright Sunshine, Young Hubert Humphrey and the Fight for Civil Rights, came out this summer to much acclaim. I looked back into when I first started emailing with Sam. It was back in June of 2020. You might remember this time period as calm, normal, regular summer. Uh, just kidding, of course. We were a few months into a global pandemic. I was working from our dining room table. Uh, Sam came to me through Mordecai Spector, who's the editor of the local Jewish newspaper, American Jewish World. Sam was hoping that he could gain access to the materials we had in the Upper Midwest Jewish Archives, as he told me he was doing some research on Hubert Humphrey. At that point, we were closed entirely to outside researchers, but I promised him that surely the pandemic would fade and we'd be open by fall. <laughs> Late summer rolls around, Sam reaches out again. Can I come and see the archives? I said, we're only open to university students, staff, and faculty. Great, Sam says. I'm a research scholar at the Humphrey School. Certainly that counts. 
Finally, we opened our reading room once again to researchers, and Sam was one of the first researchers through our doors, masked and ready to pour through collections. His dedication was clearly obvious from the start. He returned again and again through the fall and winter of 2020 as he diligently researched what, what would eventually become Into the Bright Sunshine. Over this time in the archives, we bonded over our joint appreciation for a hand-drawn map of near North Minneapolis by Clarence William Miller. And Sam also became one of a very few number of people who would actually take the time to dig deep enough and look through two unique boxes from the Jewish Community Relations Council. These boxes of three by five cards were created by and for JCRC Executive Director Sam Shiner as he monitored anti-Semitic activity around the state of Minnesota. And if you're interested, I pulled those boxes and more. Uh, they're in a vitrine along with other research materials from the archives out in the atrium. As someone who was born after Humphrey passed away, my understanding of him was the guy for whom the airport was named after. <laughs> But Sam's publication gave me such a more deep understanding to who Humphrey was, what principles and experiences guided him, and also why he was such a beloved person here in the local Jewish community. Having read Into the Bright Sunshine, I can tell you that it is a compelling, entertaining, delightful read, and I am happy to bestow upon it the highest praise I possibly can as an archivist. It is very well researched. <laughs> Sam is kindly here this evening to talk us through this research. So without further ado, please welcome Sam Friedman. Well, thank you all so much for coming out. Uh, I'm so touched to see the room filled. Um, I'm so grateful uh, to Dean German and, and to Kate Dietrich the whole library system of the U was essential to writing this book. As I said at the event at the Humphrey School that I did with the great Kirsten Delegard, of whom more will be said momentarily um, at the end of uh, September, Laura Bloomberg, then the dean at the Humphrey School, and Nisha Batwe, her successor, both kept me on this unpaid line as a research scholar for about five solid years. And I could not have done the book the way I did it without that. I didn't need the money. I get paid well by Columbia University. But what I needed was a place to work and most of all, library privileges and access to archives. And that was just absolutely baseline vital to doing this work. And so at the event uh, in September at the Humphrey School, I was able to really talk about its role. And tonight I want to talk a little bit um, about the library's role, and I think you'll hear it implicitly as I walk through the story of Humphrey in the 40s and his relationship with the Jewish community and his battle against anti-Semitism. But when we get to Q&A, if you'd like to geek out with me over research methods, I'm only too happy. Um, I first want to extend a few thanks. One is to come again to Kirsten Delegard. There are two people from the U. Kirsten and uh, Ravel and Prell, who's down speaking at the University of Wisconsin, my alma mater this week, whose work was my North Star. Kirsten with Mapping Prejudice and Historiopolis, um, Ravel and with the Campus Divided, I'm sure both of them did plenty of time in the university archives and the Berman Upper Midwest Jewish archives. Their work pointed the way for me and also set a standard of excellence that I strove to meet. Um, I also have to mention my wife, Chris Bloomquist Friedman. When you see this terrific PowerPoint, that's her work. She was for many years a designer. She also was the first editor of this manuscript, and it's always a joy to look out and see her. And as for the library, you know, I was going to talk about my correspondence with Kate, but she scooped me <laughs> on it. But it is true that, um, and this will tell you something about the incredible people who work in the library system here, that when pandemic hit, and universities shut down for in-person teaching and shut their libraries. It happened at Columbia, happened at the U, happened everywhere, basically. And the State Historical Society shut down. Uh, it presented a real crisis for me in how I was going to be able to do this book on the timetable I wanted to, which would allow it to be published 
on the 75th anniversary of this landmark civil rights speech that Hubert Humphrey gave in 1948, in other words, this past uh, July. And so that's why I was um, emailing Kate, just like I was emailing Kent Whitworth over at the Historical Society, asking when they might reopen. And of course, it was a moving target, as we all remember it. Both institutions thought maybe by the late summer of, uh, of 2020, um, that didn't happen. I was very fortunate that Mordecai Spector, who's the editor of the American Jewish World, let me sit in his office in Uptown. He had some of the bound volumes, not all of them, but my goal was to read every word published in that paper about the Jewish community in the Twin Cities from um, 1930, and in some cases I would look earlier for certain things, but 1930 through 1948, when most of the book ends. And Mordecai and I would sit at opposite ends of the office with our masks on as I would go through the bound volumes. And he was very, very generous. But then fortunately, the uh, archives here opened exactly as Kate said, on this careful, slowly scaled up basis. Um, and in fact, they were able to allow in-person research even before the State Historical Society did. And I just have to praise once more the incredible um, aplomb and skill of Kate and her whole team. I've tried to I, name them all in the acknowledgments. I have to say, the one criticism I got in a review for this book, which overall has gotten reviews like you dream of, was someone said the acknowledgments are too long. <laughs> and seriously, and I thought, man, you never wrote a book. <laughs> because the acknowledgments are for saying thanks to all those people who help you in all those different ways. And Kate and her team making those bound volumes of the American Jewish world available. And speaking of geeking out, if you grew up with paper newspapers the way I did, starting as a newspaper delivery person in Highland Park, New Jersey, and you know, on up to working for newspapers when the print entity was still the uh, coin of the realm, it's a lot of fun to turn those pages, although you have to try to make sure that they don't crumble in your hand, um, be, a, be a good archival researcher. So going through that, and then as Kate said, going through some of the other incredible holdings here involving the Jewish Community Relations Council, a remarkable man named Sam Shiner who led it for many years, whom I'll talk about. And really, in many other cases, Kate and her team when I couldn't be here in person, because I would go back to Columbia for the spring semester of 2021 to teach, were just so adroit and moved with such alacrity in fielding requests that I would make online. Um, and even Kate making me a, a print of one of my, you know, if you go to the office I have in the Humphrey School, as with every book I write, I surround myself with talismans. Um, some Humphrey tchotchkes that people gave me over the years, some pieces of pop culture that I'll even talk about a, a little later tonight. But the largest and most prominent is this hand-drawn map, and I know Kirsten Delgard has the same one, a hand-drawn map of North Minneapolis when it was the Jewish and, and black side-by-side -side ghettos in the 1920s with every store identified, every community you know, institution, whether it was the Wheatley House or whether it was the Talmud Torah, all marked. And it's, you just peer into that and you're seeing history itself. So those are my oral acknowledgments and I'm not gonna apologize for them being long <laughs> um, because you have to give credit when credit is due. And again, all props to you, Kate and Dean German and your whole team. And if you're thinking, about charitable contributions. Um, I can't think of a better place than the U and the archives here. And it's not just for Jewish topics. One of my wife's dear friends, John Borger, who passed away a number of years ago, was in addition to being a First Amendment lawyer for the Strip, a great collector of comic books and comic art, and bequeathed this whole collection here. So what's in the archives is vast, and it needs archivists to work with it, it needs to be climate controlled, so it doesn't all fall, fall to dust when you handle it. And just keep that in mind when, uh, when you're thinking of your tzedakah. In any case, um, the book as a whole tells the story of Humphrey and his leading role, along with his allies and against his adversaries, 
in the often overlooked civil rights movement of the 1940s, which was very much, very much a joint movement of blacks and Jews. And for him, integral to his role in that movement was his work as mayor of Minneapolis and even in public life here before he became mayor. I'll give you the spoiler now. The book ends at the 1948 Democratic Convention when he gives a landmark speech that persuades the Democratic Party to endorse civil rights for the first time ever. And it's a platform plank that also explicitly extends those civil rights protections on the basis of race, national origin, and religion. So it was hugely important for American Jews, for American Catholics, for Chinese Americans and Asian Americans, for Mexican Americans who were the most populous minority groups at that time. And that's the story I talked about with Kirsten at the Humphrey School and have addressed in other settings. But tonight, because I'm here on behalf of the Upper Midwest Jewish Archives, I want to tell a specific subset of that story, which is about Humphrey and the Jews of Minneapolis in this country and this battle against anti-Semitism. And, you know, we all know what the image that Jewish immigrants had of this country was that this was the golden of Medina, the golden land. And this was the place where the streets were paved with gold, even if in actuality it was more like cobblestones and manure, but where the pushcart peddlers started their way up in the path of upward mobility. This was where, you know, Sholem Aleichem lived, actually, as he was writing some of what would become the Tevye stories. And at the end of, you know, the iconic work, Fiddler on the Roof, you know, the umpteenth iteration of those initial stories, one of Tevye's daughters, of course, is going to America. And so, as with all kind of origin stories and mythologies, it's built on truth, but that truth is often incomplete, and sometimes it's affected by what's called ecstatic memory. Um, and yet, we can look at all these amazing examples of American Jewish achievement. You know, whether it's the novelist Philip Roth, whether it's RBG on the Supreme Court, Steven Spielberg, Barbara Streisand, Sandy Koufax. I mean, there's so many choices. Chris and I had quite a whittling down of who was going to be on here. Like, does Hank Greenberg make it or not? <laughs> you, know, you know, would enough people know Anzi Gazerska or not? Um, but that's part of the American Jewish success story. But there's always been a counter story, and we're living with some of it right now, of course. But it's the story of the Unite the Right rally and the story of the, you know, dog whistles used about George Soros and globalism. We know what that always means. And the attack, the massacre at the Tree of Life Synagogue and Voldemort here and, the, you know, and the role he's played in stirring up and giving public acceptance to some of those attitudes. And that's not a new element. That's been something we fought in this country in the past as well. And it seems to recur. There's something that Sam Shiner said to his daughter, Susan Druskin, who still lives in town, is in her 80s. When I interviewed her for my book, I asked her what it was like to watch the Unite the Right rally. She was watching CNN's coverage of it. And she said she was shocked, but she wasn't surprised. And I said, why? And she said, because my father always told me the haters never go away, they just hide. And so that brings us back to Hubert Humphrey in his time and in this place. And these years when he was starting in public life in the early 1940s, serving as mayor from 1945 to 1948, and then vaulting into national political life very much on the strength of what he had done as mayor of Minneapolis in these twinned battles against racism and anti-Semitism. And this, the Minneapolis that Humphrey came to, I think more of you in this audience know this history than typically the audiences I speak to who still think about Minneapolis as blue and it must have always been blue and Minnesota nice and all that. This was, after all, the city of Charles Lindbergh, the exponent, the most treacherous embodiment because of his aviation heroism of isolationism in this country, of the idea the United States shouldn't get involved in World War II. And in his notorious speech in Des Moines, Iowa, in the early 1940s, he explicitly said that the only people who wanted America to get into the war were the Jews, the bankers, and the British. 
And of course, Jews and bankers were the same things. So it was a little bit redundant, but everybody needs an editor. And he was, of course, a hometown hero and a respectable face for those despicable attitudes. Minneapolis was also a place where those people in the logo gear there uh, had a very welcome mat out for them. That's the Silver Legion, more popularly known as the Silver Shirts. The Silver Shirts were a group that was explicitly modeled on Hitler's paramilitaries, the Brown Shirts, in the 1930s. And that, as I said, met often and with a large following here in Minneapolis. The Silver Shirts were championed, as other um, Nazi apologists were, by no less a figure here than Senator Ernest Lundin. Once, once upon a time, a New Dealer and a pacifist in World War I who took a turn into the isolationist nativist right and actually was giving speeches that were being written for him by a Nazi agent. You can actually find out a lot more about that in Rachel Maddow's podcast, Ultra, and her new book, uh, Prequel. And then the religious, uh, oh, and, by, and the silver shirts, when they met here, in spite of what the proper establishment in Minneapolis would say, when the Jewish community would raise objections to the silver shirts, and the response would be, you know, only the great unwashed are going there, only the ignorant and resentful during the depredations of the Great Depression are going to those meetings. The good people of this city wouldn't go there, but the good people did go there. The president of the Board of Ed went to their meetings. The head of the Citizens Alliance, the Employers Association that fought against the unions in the trucker strike of 1934, that, that president went there. Doctors, teachers, lawyers, dentists went there. Plenty of respectable people went to the Silver Shirts meetings. And then the religious tone in Minneapolis was set by this man with his pocket square and three-piece suit and his pious stature, Reverend William Bell Riley, the pastor of First Baptist Church down on Hennepin. And William Bell Riley was an erudite man, and he was very proud in his sermons to be able to knowledgeably cite Plato and George Bernard Shaw and Shakespeare, and he very much prided himself on not being the Bible-thumping type of fundamentalist, hence the attire. He saved headlines when he would speak on the road that would extol him for being a different sort of fundamentalist. And he was an institution builder in a way that matters a lot in the Christian world. Not only did he build up the congregation at First Baptist, he started a university, which is now University of the Northwest, up north of St. Paul, and he trained missionaries, and he had a publishing house. And he also, his second holy book after the Bible was the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, the forgery from Tsarist Russia that blamed Jews for the Bolshevik Revolution or for the coming revolution and said that their goal was world revolution and world domination. And when William Bell Riley was introduced to this text in the mid-1930s, by um, a minister friend of his from Kentucky, the skies opened, the world made sense. William Bell Riley's first big crusade in public life in Minneapolis had been against the teaching of evolution at the U and in schools, and in fact, little factoid, William Bell Riley was the person who told William Jennings Bryan about the impending Scopes trial in Tennessee and got him to go and uh, prosecute John Scopes. Um, but then Riley, like um, Brian, loses that battle. But then he gets the next holy book, the Protocols. And now what he knows his battle is, is against Jewish domination of the world. And when he's called out on this, as he sometimes is, this is the way he responds. This is um, a quote from one of his sermons. Fact number one, the Jew fingerprints of the Protocols are in every nation on earth. Fact number two, the representatives of this race are at the elbow of every great ruler on earth, dictating national policies. The protocols present a definite plan to have every movement that would stall the political maneuvers of Jewry labeled, air quote, and he uses air quotes, persecution, in order to blind the soft-hearted Gentile nation until the communist coup is accomplished. And at another time, 
when a Jewish attorney in town actually went to the effort to write Riley and said it's dangerous when someone of your stature says these things, Riley wrote back in one of his other common tones, more in sorrow than anger, why then has the Jew become unpopular in this country? It is my profound conviction he is nobody to blame for it but himself. And when someone like Riley could put toxins like that into the public discourse, it made it permissible for others to say those things and others to think those things. And it's not that there weren't liberal theologians in town too, like Reverend Philip Grevely, Gregory at First Congregational or Reuben Youngdahl down at Mount Olivet Lutheran, but they were pushing against the tide. And this was the Minneapolis that existed in the 1930s. And Hubert Humphrey was here for part of the 30s going to school, but for reasons I'll get to later, was kind of oblivious to this. And what went with those attitudes was kind of a wrap around anti-Semitism that covered all the institutions of this, of this city. You can see the beautiful headquarters, the Minneapolis AAA there on the bottom left. I first thought it was an urban legend when I think Tom Friedman, of course, of a Minneapolitan, mentioned in one of his columns years ago that Jews couldn't belong to AAA, but I found from my research it's absolutely true. In fact, I found one anecdote. Um, Sam Shiner wanted to test whether it was really that ironclad, so he sent a rabbi to apply for membership, thinking, you know, surely they'll accept a rabbi. But no, the rabbi got a letter back, which I probably found in the archives here, saying, uh, we believe that people of your persuasion would find it more welcoming at the St. Paul AAA, <laughs> which in fact had a Jewish president. And then you had the Minneapolis Club, the you know, most elite club in town. And you had the restrictive covenants and Kirsten Delgard's amazing project, Mapping Prejudice. You can look at all the neighborhoods that had covenants against Jews or blacks or Catholics or Native Americans or Nisai buying homes in them. And this was repeatedly pointed out to the Minneapolis establishment by writers over the first 45 years of the 20th century, sometimes writers from the Jewish community, sometimes writers from outside. And it culminated with an article by Carrie McWilliams, a great muckraker, called The Curious Twin. And the twin he was referring to, of course, was St. Paul. And he pondered the question of why were these two places separated, sometimes just by a street or a property line, sometimes by a river, so different in terms of the acceptance or lack thereof they gave Jews and blacks. And my conclusion is that demography was destiny. St. Paul was a plurality Catholic city in which the Catholics looking at the region and knowing they were a minority in the you know, region of the upper Midwest knew they had to find political allies among other minority groups. So Catholics look to Jews and blacks as their allies. And it's not that everyone was so idealistic in St. Paul, but pragmatically, when you have an effective political machine, as they did there, you have to share the, you know, the goodies of the machine, the jobs, the appointments, and so forth with the people who vote with you. And it just created a different, more tolerant climate in St. Paul. And Minneapolis, I hardly need to tell you, was an overwhelmingly Protestant city. Scandinavian, British Isles, Northern European, with such a demographic majority that it needed to give no quarter to minorities, and indeed it gave no quarter to minorities. So this is the city that Hubert Humphrey will find and will take on. And I have to say though, Hubert Humphrey is the most unlikely person on the face of the earth to have become the great battler for the rights of blacks and Jews here in Minneapolis and in the country. Because Hubert Humphrey grows up in this little fly speck of a place, Dolan, South Dakota. You can see it there about a decade before he's born, which itself mirrors the demography of Minneapolis, except even more so. Protestant, Scandinavian, Northern European, British Isles. Um, it's a place where what passes for a minority group is a Catholic town 10 miles away, a bunch of French Canadian Catholics, 
And just to make sure they knew their place, the Ku Klux Klan would periodically pay a visit outside that town named of Turton and burn crosses. And for a while when Humphrey was growing up and wheat prices were high because Dolan was out there about 250 miles due west of here, just take Highway 212 and you'll get there. And it was a prosperous place for that time. And Humphreys had the most beautiful house in town. And the reason you know that, aside from the fact that I've been there myself and could compare and contrast, is that a thousand miles from any ocean, it had a widow's walk. <laughs> so that's what we call an affectation. Um, and Humphrey's father ran the local drugstore, which, because Doland was dry, was the gathering place in town. And it's where Hubert himself would, you know, do his unpaid filial labor working at the drugstore. But also, it was a place where he learned from his father an important lesson. Humphrey's father is a complicated piece of work. There's a little bit of the con man in him. He made a lot of money selling patent medicines, which is basically alcohol masquerading as, as medication. And he was a fantasist, whether it was thinking he'd become governor of South Dakota or thinking because he loved opera, he could order a whole bunch of Caruso records and sell them to farmers. Um, but he was also idealistic, and he was a liberal Democrat in a town of conservative Republicans. He was an, ag an agnostic in a town of church-going Protestants. And he told his son about dealing with people who were different. If you treat them like a dog, expect to be bitten. And I think that built into Hubert Humphrey from an early stage a certain open-mindedness. It didn't dictate his whole life, but it tells you something about his temperament. But you know, that doesn't tell us everything. In fact, doesn't tell us nearly enough. Because Hubert Humphrey came here, he started at the U, the fall of the stock market crash, sort of bad timing. Um, his family had already lost their home, then proceeded to lose their drugstore. Midway through his sophomore year, he goes home to hurriedly get a pharmacy license and help them set up in a new town, uh, Huron, South Dakota. And for five years is out there with the family trying to weather not only the dust storms, but the economic collapse. And it's in those years when he does become a new dealer because he sees firsthand what the new deal does. And then finally, he comes back to the U at the behest of his wife, Muriel, who's urging him that if he wants to make good on the political ambitions he says he has, he's got to stop being such a loyal son and pull apart from his father. And he does come back here and is imbued with more of the New Deal sensibility of a couple of great professors here, Ben Lippincott and Everett Kirkpatrick and graduates at the advanced age of 28 because of his long stop out in the summer of 1939. That doesn't explain why Humphrey became the person he became. There were a lot of New Dealers out there and the New Dealer, the New Deal for mostly for better, but in some ways for worse, looked only at economic issues. It only looked at America inequality through the prism of class. It didn't look at forms of prejudice and try to take them on. It had a kind of a passive hope that rising economic fortunes would lift all boats. But even, you know, but Franklin Roosevelt infamously made his bargain with the segregationist wing of his party, for instance, never to have a civil rights plank in the party platform and to allow New Deal programs to be implemented in a racist apartheid way in the South in exchange for Southern votes on election day and from Southern legislators in Congress. So if Humphrey had remained a New Dealer, who knows? But in 1939, he's now married, he's the father of an infant daughter, Nancy, and he wants to go to grad school and he needs the money because Muriel's been working full time, he's also been working part time, they need both of those incomes to try to support themselves. Now Muriel, with a newborn, can't work full time anymore. So he gets an offer from a friend of Reverend Kirkpatrick's, who's a professor at LSU, Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge, who writes this letter to Kirkpatrick saying, you know, almost in these words, if you know any Yankee who would come down to Dixie, I have a $400 assistance ship. And first of all, LSU at that time actually was being built into a respectable institution. The very complicated populist governor 
of uh, Louisiana. Huey Long had been assassinated a couple years earlier, but before then, some of his better angels went towards making LSU academically respectable. And the other thing about Humphrey going there is that $400 stipend. I've done the math on one of those very convenient apps, and $400 in 1939 is $8,500 now. So this was a significant amount of money to stake him and Muriel and Nancy. And so he goes to Baton Rouge. And when he's there, he has three life-changing experiences. One is that he lives in a black, around black people for the first time in his life. Baton Rouge is one-third black, where Humphrey and Muriel live is separated by a mile and a half from the LSU campus, and in between is the main black neighborhood of Baton Rouge, sometimes called the Bottoms. So he sees Jim Crow in action, and he is appalled by it, not because he has a theory about race in this country, but because he has a fundamental decency that's offended. But he also, less expectedly, makes the first Jewish friend of his life, a man named Alvin Rubin, birth name Avraham Rabinowitz, who's the son of an immigrant from Lithuania, who in this kind of classic Jewish way, you know, gets here, got his push cart, going around the South pedaling, gets tired of pedaling, ends up in Alexandria, Louisiana, doing what? But of course, running the dry goods store. And that's where Alvin Rubin grows up and becomes this terrific student, goes to LSU, and he's Humphrey's teammate on the debate team. And as part of their friendship, Alvin Rubin talks to Humphrey about his five paternal uncles, his father's five brothers, who were all at that moment trapped in Lithuania, which is being pincered between the Nazis and the Soviets, because this is the era of the Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact, the Nazi-Soviet Pact to carve up Eastern Europe between themselves. And ultimately, all five of those uncles will perish in the Holocaust. And this is the beginning of Humphrey being sensitized to something about the Jewish experience over there, but also over here. It's also the beginning of him understanding the need to intervene against great evil. Because remember, when I was talking about um, Lindbergh before, there's a strong tendency in America to stay out of the war. There's a strong isolationist movement. And because of the Nazi-Soviet pact, now it comes not only from the nativist right, it comes from the left as well. Because in one of those shifts of the common turn line, the party line literally changes one day um, with Stalin. The Soviet Union goes from saying to the popular front, we are the tip of the spear in the global battle against fascism, to you know what, let's stay out of the imperialist capitalist war. And so all of a sudden, communists, fellow travelers, popular front people, useful idiots, all those people on the left are suddenly against entering the war against fascism too. So it's incredibly significant that Humphrey begins to turn towards interventionism from his friendship with Alvin Rubin. And then what ties it all together is this couple, Rudolf Aberly and his wife Franziska. So Rudolf Aberly is Humphrey's professor in a year-long seminar at LSU. He had been a sociology professor at the University of Kiel in Germany. And Franziska's father, who had been his mentor, was an early leader in you know, anti-Nazi scholarship there. And Rudolf Eberly, as his mentor, follows suit. And Eberly is so distressed to see how within the phase of three or four years, a country that he assumed was enlightened and tolerant and cultured would embrace Nazism. And so he began in the early 30s to do field research to try to answer that question. And he comes up with some very compelling answers about the complacency of people in the middle who thought that the attacks would never touch them, about the cynicism of establishment conservatives who thought, well, these Nazi thugs will be useful to beat down the unions and beat down you know, the communists and the socialists, but we're going to control them. But of course, the tiger always rides you in the end. And so that scholarship is already putting Eberly at odds with the Nazi regime. But then he's asked to submit his family tree. And it shows that he has one Jewish great-grandparent. 
And so even though his family had converted to Christianity generations before, of course, in Hitler's eyes, one-eighth Jewish is 100% Jewish. And so for his scholarship and for his bloodlines, he's stripped of his position, his assets are seized, he's sent into exile, and he winds up with Franziska and her three young kids on the docks of Baltimore in 1938, wondering where am I going to work and how are we going to survive? And LSU, to its credit, gives him a position as an instructor. Ultimately, he'll be a full professor there. And when Humphrey takes the seminar with him, Eberly does three things in the sem seminar. First, he talks about his scholarship, which is actually published ultimately by LSU Press in English. Second, he talks about his family's experience of dispossession and exile and refugee life. And third, he says to Humphrey and the other classmates that the position of Jews in Nazi Germany is the position of blacks in the Jim Crow South, something that will really stay with Humphrey. And finally, he says words that embed themselves in Humphrey's memory to such a degree that decades later, when he's writing to Eberly on the occasion of Eberly's 80th birthday, he recalls them, a day when Eberly casts his gaze at the dozen students and says, if we were in Germany, maybe two of you would have stood up to the Nazis. And I think Humphrey takes this as his mission statement. And so when he comes back to Minneapolis, I think he comes here with the idea of, I'm going to be one of those two. You know, we talk about the last of the just, right? So this was his version from Eberly of being some of the last, one of the last of the just. And some people with Humphrey's politics and with his experiences in the South might have come back north and said, wow, I'm glad I left the benighted, ignorant South, and now I'm here in the tolerant, you know, educated North. It's the opposite for Humphrey. When he comes back to Minneapolis, now the scales fall from his eyes. Now he sees what's been hiding in plain sight in terms of racism and anti-Semitism all along. But he also needs people to continue his moral education here. And that's where these two amazing men come in. On the left is Cecil Newman, a former Pullman porter who has used his savings from working the trains to found a series of publications, most famous and most enduringly the Minneapolis Spokesman which to this day is the paper of record for black Minneapolis and is published and edited by his granddaughter, Tracy Williams Dillard. And the other one who was a good friend of Cecil Newman's, Sam Shiner. Sam Shiner and Cecil Newman had fought lonely battles, unsuccessful battles by this time for a decade or more. For Cecil Newman, it meant using the pages of the spokesman not only to call out racism in all of its forms, police brutality, bigoted labor unions that wouldn't have black members, workplaces that wouldn't have black employees, the coded language the newspapers would use to build up stereotypes about black people and crime. But Newman was constantly making the parallel that Rudolf Aberle had made between the Nazi treatment of the Jews and America's treatment of blacks. He saw the parallel and he understood the battles against racism and anti-Semitism were one battle. And I still remember a headline he wrote after one particular incident. I don't remember at this moment what the incident was, but a terrible incident of anti-Semitism in this country and maybe even in Minneapolis. And his headline was, Hitler must be laughing because Cecil Newman could see the hypocrisy in America's veneer of moral superiority. And then Sam Shiner graduated from law school, and of course no reputable law firm in Minneapolis would give him a job because he was a Jew. And so for most of the 1930s, he's making his living playing jazz piano in the nightclubs. And then after the series of Silver Shirts meetings in the late 30s, and after the blasé attitude of the establishment about those meetings, the Jewish community here is so distressed that they raise the money to put him on salary, and he becomes basically this one-man anti-defamation league. 
And some of what he does is intelligence gathering. That's why if you have a chance to look at the amazing exhibit Kate has out in the lobby, I encourage you, because you'll see these index cards that he had. So Sam Shiner would do such things as write letters to resorts, asking, you know, get Jewish people to write letters asking for reservations at the resorts so he could get the proof that they wouldn't accept Jews. And he sent his rabbi to the AAA to be turned away and sent to St. Paul. And Sam Shiner even personally, when he tried to buy a house in St. Louis Park, even though it later became a great home for Jews, at this point in the 30s, gets a threat from an anonymous threat and a gunshot is fired into the home that he was thinking of buying. But a lot of what Sam Shiner does with his intelligence gathering is get idealistic young Gentile students from the U to go and infiltrate these meetings for him, to go to William Bell Riley's worship services and jot down what he was saying about the protocols of the elders of Zion, to go to meetings of groups like the Silver Shirts and their successors, especially Gerald L. K. Smith, another regular visitor to the Twin Cities with his America First political party and political movement, and jot down what was being said, and, some, and also to write down the license plates so you could see who was attending these meetings. And it was really remarkable to go through Sam Shiner's card collection there. And my favorite was his card for William Bell Riley. So it's Riley, comma, Reverend William Bell, and the descriptor was one word, fascist. <laughs> but Sam Shiner would try to leak some of what he found to the newspapers. He would try to talk to the cops or the FBI about it. And he, like Cecil Newman, made no headway because the blacks and the Jews were small populations. They're cumulatively 3%, 4% of Minneapolis's population at this time. They don't have the votes to matter to anyone running for elective office. They can be ignored. And then Humphrey comes to town. And he needs Sam Shiner and Cecil Newman to teach him. But in return, he provides them with something they've never had before, access to political power. He doesn't have it yet in 1940, but he's on his way to achieving it. But he already has political ambition and political skills. And what he accomplishes here, and what's going to be so important to the, the battle for civil rights in this country, is impossible without the triad of Shiner, Newman, and Humphrey. And Humphrey gets here. He's giving a lot of speeches for war mobilization as an employee of the federal government. Um, he runs for mayor in 1943 as a fairly conventional candidate. He's put up to it by the labor unions. So he's running as the candidate of organized labor. He's talking about the crime downtown, the city charter. He's emphasizing he's Norwegian, uh, which makes a lot of sense electorally here. And he's a vigorous campaigner running against a complacent incumbent named Marvin Klein, um, and he almost defeats him. But then the next year, the Humphrey will come to know and respect really emerges. And it emerges this way. The aforementioned Gerald L. K. Smith is coming to town for one of his regular visits. And he wants to use the municipal auditorium to give a speech, and he's here again. Ernest Lundin, Nazi sympathizer, senator, has died by this time, but his widow, Norma, is always there to give a proper welcome to Gerald L. K. Smith. But because Smith, in this case, in 1944, is going to speak in a public building, the municipal auditorium, he needs city council permission. And this becomes a huge controversy in the city. And the city council has an open hearing packs out the council chambers, and Humphrey, as a private citizen, is there to speak that night. And there are all kinds of denunciations of Smith for all kinds of reasons. You get the sense that Smith's heard them all before and kind of wears them, you know, proudly, if anything. But Humphrey says something that, in the language of the young people today, really bugs out Gerald L. K. Smith. And what Humphrey says is that you, because Smith, keep in mind, is always flourishing the fact that he's a Christian minister. You know, he's pastored churches. And Humphrey says in his public comments, 
you can't be a good Christian and hate Jews because Jesus was a Jew. And these days, asserting the historical Jesus as Jewishness is a no-brainer. Almost any theologian and learned layperson knows that. But in the 1940s, to say this in this city, in William Bell Riley's city, to Gerald L. K. Smith, well, here's the kind of response it got Humphrey. And this is a letter from a teacher, Miss Ida Shaning, who lived in a lovely house in Kenwood. <laughs> it wasn't just the dirt bags. Mr. Humphrey, what makes you a Christian? When did you become a Christian? What did you do to become a Christian? Jesus Christ has no place for counterfeit Christians in his ranks. You belong to that modernist outfit who do not believe in the Bible. The modernist preachers have reduced Jesus the Christ to a mere man, putting him in the same place the Jews have placed him. Mr. Humphrey, everyone who knows the Bible knows that Jesus was not a Jew. Jesus was God's only begotten son. Certainly no one would have the stupidity to say that God is a Jew. Mr. Humphrey, if Jesus is a Jew as you claim, then pray. Why don't the Jews bestow a bit of their brotherly love on him? Answer me that. What's more, it's about time that this anti-Semitic bugaboo were dragged out into the open and exposed for what it is, a big lie cooked up by the Jews themselves to make it seem that other Americans are picking on them. And then by doing a lot of whining and shouting of anti-Semitism, air quotes included, draw sympathy to themselves and through it gain political advantage. That was the kind of reaction he got for speaking out in a way no one with power in political life had ever spoken out on behalf of the Jewish community here. Now Humphrey did not answer her directly although it was a lovely 16-page handwritten letter. The penmanship is A+. Plus. The spelling is impeccable. The punctuation is flawless, all of which makes it all the more disturbing. But I think this was Humphrey's response. About three weeks later, he was asked to speak, I think, at Temple Israel. I may be wrong on that. But he gave what we would call a Devar Torah. Now, literally speaking, a Devar Torah, as we know, addresses the parsha you know, or maybe the Haftarah portion of that week's Shabbat service. And Humphrey didn't do that. But as someone who's an extremely learned Christian who'd grown up in the Methodist church and been very affected by the social gospel and knew scripture really well, and it's one of the underappreciated aspects of his liberalism, he talked about the social justice prophets. He talked about Amos and Hosea and Isaiah and Jeremiah. And when... He says what I'm going to read. You can tell he knew these verses from Isaiah that were later repurposed by Luke in the New Testament. And he says that night, we have relied on ritual, on pious pronouncements rather than action. Faith is only as strong as its believers. We have failed to believe. We just accept it. The ancient prophets all cried out against injustice, proclaiming the doctrine of social justice. And then he went on, in frankly, rather self-aggrandizing way, to give his own Ten Commandments. <laughs> okay, overstepping a little bit, yeah, but what can I say? Even a good Christian, I guess, is a supersessionist. But, um, but he says, for him, one of the commandments is this. I am the Lord thy God, but thou shalt remember I am also the God of the earth. I have no favorite children. The Negro, the Hindu... The Chinese, the Russian, and Mexican are all my beloved children. And then he went on to say that the commandment against bearing false witness should also include proscribing what he called the malicious propaganda of bigotry against the Negro in America, the Jew, the Japanese American. These are bold things to say. Keep in mind, by the way, he's talking about Japanese Americans during the period of Japanese incarceration. This is not a popular stand to take. And so this moment in 1944 sets the table locally. And of course, it's happening against the backdrop of the Shoah. And when the war is coming to an end, as Humphrey is running for mayor in the spring and early summer of 1945, that's when Dwight Eisenhower, after American troops 
have um, liberated the Ordruf concentration camp in Germany, brings in journalists. He thinks people will not believe what has happened on the home front if you don't have the photos and the newsreels. And so those newsreels are playing in Minneapolis theaters at that time. And articles by American reporters in English are being written at that time. And it, the, and it is impossible to be a sensate Minneapolitan at that time or an American and not finally understand what had befallen the Jews of Europe. And that's very much the backdrop of Humphrey, no, sorry, I'm going to go back, of Humphrey running for mayor at that time. And you know, you would think, and, and, and the revelation cuts two ways. On the one hand, it creates tremendous sympathy for Jews in this moment. And this is a moment when a lot of GIs are coming back to study at the U, or they're coming back to their families here, and they're coming back with the sense that somehow there's unfinished business in the fight against fascism here at home. It isn't just abroad. But on the other hand, at a time when you would think that there would not be assaults on Jews, they're happening right here in Minneapolis. They're happening right here on the north side. Right as Humphrey's running for mayor, right as the newsreels are playing, right as the articles are appearing, Jewish kids are having their cars forced off the road by other cars. They're being pu pushed through plate glass windows and then having their attackers say, let me see that Jew blood. They're being beaten and forced to give the Heil Hitler salute. And one night in April, 1945, there's a mass meeting up at Lincoln Junior High on the north side. And one of the rabbis in town says, is this what our boys have been dying for overseas? So this can happen on the home front. And the incumbent mayor there, Marvin Klein, and his police chief are both there that night. And they wave it off. It's just teenage hooliganism. And Humphrey's response is, Minneapolis has been warned repeatedly about its problem with bigotry. And it was inevitable that it would become violent. And now it has. And Humphrey's campaign then is based on a five-point pla five platform to take on bigotry in the city against blacks and against Jews. And this doesn't seem like what would be a winning plank in a city that's three or four percent black and Jewish. And yet Humphrey wins a smashing victory. And some of it, again, is because of Klein's lassitude as a campaigner and Humphrey's energy. But it's also this moment that Humphrey captures and this sense that America has unfinished business at home that he can articulate. And when he gets to be mayor, he understands that you have to take on bigotry in two ways. You have to change laws and you have to change minds. One without the other is not sufficient. He changes laws by pushing through one of the nation's first really hardening laws on employment discrimination, outlawing it. He moves forward on a law against restric restrictive covenants in housing, although when the Supreme Court hands down a ruling declaring covenants unconstitutional, that supersedes Humphrey's law. He does it by mandating for the whole police force, which had harassed Jews as much as it harassed blacks in the city, has to go to the U for human relations training. And when the city pushes through a human rights ordinance, Humphrey mandates that every police officer has to carry a written copy of it on duty. And we can say that one of the tragedies of Humphrey's vault into the U.S. Senate in 1948 is that his police reform agenda was never completed. And that's the road to George Floyd under Derek Chauvin's knee. But the other thing Humphrey knows is you have to change minds. And so he brings in, really audaciously, a black scholar, Charles Johnson from Fisk University in Nashville, the HBCU that will later educate John Lewis, to lead a survey to send out volunteers. And you can see one of them visiting a Nisai mom and her child and a black mom and her children. And they would hand out questionnaires and basically develop what we would now call a database of the degree of prejudice in this city uh, on the part of all facets of society, the education system, recreation, police, big business, labor unions, et cetera, churches, and also anecdotal accounts to back it up. And Humphrey used that leverage 
to get the city council, which was indifferent to these issues, to finally move forward on them. And again, even for a popular mayor, this came with risks. We're talking about the mid-1940s here. But Humphrey is getting national cred credibility for it. You can see the magazine article, Humphrey Beats the Bigots. He speaks on WCCO for a wonderful radio series called Neither Free Nor Equal. And it's, he brings in the film, Gentleman's Agreement, that is this popular film showing the kind of po face of popular, polite anti-Semitism in this country. And with Sam Shiner's help, has showings of it all around the city. So he's being acclaimed, his star is rising, but there are people who don't share that joy at it. And one night in February 1947, Humphrey's coming home late at night from a typical night of, on the rubber chicken circuit for the mayor. And by this time, he'd already had at least one credible assassination threat against him that his terrific police chief, Ed Ryan, had intercepted and made sure Humphrey changed his route home that night. And he'd been the subject of an incredible amount of hate mail. Um, but so Humphrey has a police escort to take him home every night. And normally, the police officer drives Humphrey's front door just uh, north of Dinky Town, walks him to the door to make sure he gets inside safely. This night, there are a couple of aldermen in the car. And Humphrey's like, just, you know, Officer Bartholomew, just take them home. I'm OK. So he walks without his police guard to the front door. Strange thing, the street light nearest his front door is out. And so he's there like bending over the front door, working his key in the lock, and one, then two more bullets whiz by his head. Muriel's been waiting up for him. She heard the noise, she thought it was a car backfiring. She opens the door, bundles him in, slams the door. Humphrey says, why would anyone want to kill me? And then they try to put together what happened. And one thing Muriel remembers is that their pet dog, Tippy, had barked right around the time of the backfire, or what she thought was the backfire. And what they realize is that Tippy's barking must have broken the concentration of the shooter. And that's the only reason he missed. Well, more hate mail proceeds to come in. And some of it's very eerily sophisticated, because a lot of it's claiming that this was the Jewish gangsters downtown trying to kill Humphrey, that this was Kid Can, you know, and Yiddy Bloom and them. This is someone smart enough to throw attention on people who had committed other murders, as we know about Kid Can. But of course, it's ridiculous that Kid Can would have killed someone who was a hero to the Jews of Minneapolis, because the Jewish gangsters wanted to be an acceptable part of this community. And so eventually, the police come around to this fellow, Maynard Orlando Nelson who's an army veteran, who's an ardent follower of Gerald L.K. Smith. And he is so indignant about the way Humphrey's tangled with Gerald L.K. Smith. And he is so outraged by Humphrey's civil rights agenda and the self-study that surely he was the one who took those shots. And when the police arrest him on some other charges, they find knives, guns, brass knuckles. Of course, what kind of gun would a neo-Nazi have? A German Luger, um, a map of World War III, correspondence with a white supremacist group called the Colombians in Georgia, who, if any of you know the film or play Driving Miss Daisy or read Melissa Faye Green's book, The Temple Bombing, these were the people who bombed the Reform Temple in Atlanta about a decade later because its rabbi, Jack Rothschild, was uh, a big advocate of civil rights and a friend of Martin Luther King's. So those were Maynard Orlando Nelson's pen pals. And Humphrey never brought charges against Nelson. He managed to keep the assassination attempt out of the papers for six weeks. And I think he just didn't want Nelson to have the pulpit of a trial and to get to play the martyr. And I think he thought because Nelson was going to be arrested for other things, he'd go away. And he did go away. And having read Nelson's declassified, declassified FBI file, I can tell you exactly where he went. He went to the southwest side of Chicago to join the American Nazi Party. Anyway, all of Humphrey's work in Minneapolis brings him to the attention of the National Democratic Party. And at the convention in 1948, the huge battle isn't over who will be nominated. Everyone knows it'll be Truman. Most people expect he'll lose. 
It's the Civil Rights Plank. And it's at that convention when Humphrey gives the speech of his life. It's the speech, and I want to read a bit of it, that he has to give over and against Harry Truman's desire not to have a civil rights plank so we can keep the South, over and against the threat of the Dixiecrat wing of the party to bolt the convention and run their own candidate and try to deprive Truman of enough electoral votes to win. And Humphrey's been threatened by Truman's people, even your political career is over if you give this speech. But he gives it anyway, and there's an interesting Jewish angle to that. He'd been in Philadelphia for the whole week before the convention. That week, Muriel was doing what a Minnesotan does, which is looking for a lakeside resort for a week's vacation. <laughs> and she gets a tip from Jane Freeman's mother, okay, or Freeman's wife's mother, that the place they're going to go to has a covenant against renting to Jews, as well as, of course, blacks and other minorities. And she writes to Humphrey, to Hubert, that is, and says, I'm going to go up to this resort and find out if it's true. So she goes up there on the Sunday of the convention week. And she writes Humphrey a letter about what she finds. Humphrey gets and reads that letter the morning of July 14th, 1948, which is the day he will give this speech. He reads this letter after he's pulled an all-nighter drafting that speech and is still worrying about whether he will give it. And I have to believe that the letter from Muriel puts some extra steel in his spine because what Muriel writes to him is, well, I drove up there and Jane's mother is right and I confronted the couple and they said, well, if we rent it to some Jews, then we have to rent to all the Jews. You know, why can't everybody on the lake, you know, share some of the Jews? Um, and she says to Humphrey, we can't stay there. This is not our values. This is not our politics. And I just have to believe this was somewhere in Humphrey's great capacious brain as he gave the speech. And I'm just going to read the one most eloquent paragraph from this exceptional speech. You can hear the whole thing on YouTube if you're interested. It's, it's great. He says, my friends, to those who say that we are rushing this issue of civil rights, I say to them we were 172 years too late, meaning back to 1776. That's my edition, not his. To those who say that this civil rights program is an infringement on states' rights, I say the time has arrived in America for the Democratic Party to get out of the shadow of states' rights and to walk forthrightly into the bright sunshine of human rights. There's a good book title in there somewhere. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Thank you so much. I want to be respectful of people's time, and so unfortunately we've run out of time for Q&A, but Sam will be here um, in the lobby um, to um, sign any of your books. There's books um, for sale. There's going to also be treats in there. So um, apologies we ran out of time, but if you have questions, Sam I, will I'm be I'm sorry. Around. It must be in the spirit of Humphrey. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you so much. Yes, and I'll just say I'll be out there, and I have four words for you. Hanukkah, Christmas, Kwanzaa, and Festivus. Wow. <laughs> thank you.